Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers. For inside analysis and behind-the-scenes commentary from Santa Barbara's top journalists and local political leaders about the most important news events in our community. I'm your host, Congested Jerry Roberts. Tonight, we'll look behind these headlines. Widespread confusion in Montecito as homeowners scramble for answers about what happens next. A look inside the murky finances and management of Bella Squardo, our biggest white elephant. The bitter legal war between City Hall and Santa Barbara's most notorious landlord comes to a head. And despite dramatic winter rains, the deep drought keeps water supplies dangerously low. Our panel tonight, investigative reporter Melinda Burns. Tyler Hayden, news editor of the Santa Barbara Independent. Nick Welsh, executive editor of The Indy. And former city council member Dale Francisco. Thank you all for coming. Melinda, your reporting in Montecito has revealed a tangle of confusion for residents whose homes were destroyed or damaged. What are they being told about rebuilding? Well, they've been advised um, to hold off until FEMA finishes a, an interim map uh, showing the, the new topography of Montecito and the new floodwaters height that that buildings will have to... So the uh, entire landscape has been transformed. Well, along all those creeks, so Montecito, Hot Springs, Cold Springs, and um, San Isidro and Romero. It's a completely changed landscape. You cannot recognize the landscape. And you, you walked down the creek for I yesterday did, yes. afternoon with a geologist? I did from uh, roughly below Ashley Road down to Casa Dorinda, uh, just to get an idea of um, what happened in that creek. And, um, and to find out more about the survey that, that the uh, UCSB um, scientists are doing out there in, in the field. Now, FEMA is using LIDAR. In other words, they collected this data by plane with uh, laser lights that bounce off the terrain below and, 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 sh and show a very detailed topography map. They're not going out of their office, and they're going to do this I, map. I, I won't ask you what. LIDAR is an acronym for, but I'm sure I'm sure you know. It was in your piece, so they, they, we, we can, you can read it on Newsmakers with JR. Um, so that's going to take three months, and then for the new map, three to four months. It will be, it will come out for public review in May, likely if it's on schedule, and then it will be adopted in June. And that's an interim map. It'll take four or five years for the feds to finish the the flood insurance rate maps, which are more comprehensive. But, but some people are anxious to get going on rebuilding. You know, it's interesting. Um, the county says that they've issued about 95 very minor building permits, so minor repairs. I'm guessing... 90? That, yes, and that's out of, you know, 500 homes that were affected. But some of those were green tagged, meaning they just had a bunch of mud, but not in the house. And there might be minor repairs there, but on the badly destroyed and and completely destroyed homes, so 350 of those, there are only five homeowners who are requesting to move ahead b before the FEMA maps come out, and um, and so they have to meet with the county, and then the county has to tell them what information they have to come up with, and it's probably going to wind up that they, you know, the whole thing is going to take time until the maps come out anyway. Who's in charge? Who's the decision maker? Well, the county um, planning department issues the permits, and they have not issued any building permits for um, new buildings um, or major repairs. If you're making repairs that amount to more than 50% of the assessed value of your property, of your house, uh, you have to wait um, until the FEMA maps are out. Tyler, um, your close personal friend Bill McFadden was on last week and talking about how some, a lot of people in Montecito were unhappy about the evacuation mm -hmm. plans. Either they didn't get enough people out when it mattered or they got too many people out. What's, you've been writing a lot about that. What's, what's the status? Is there gonna be any accountability or investigation or anything about that? I think so. I think, um, well, I've heard actually 
as of yesterday, that there are a couple of attorneys out there just waiting for a plaintiff to step forward and and um, and, and sort of to, to hang the case on that the county was perhaps negligent in in its uh, education and warning of the public before the storm, that the um, that the decisions that went into drawing the line where it was at 192 were um, based on some faulty faulty assumptions and and information. So there's there's a a real undercurrent of frustration and ad, uh, anger and sadness there that I get the sense is moving towards uh, a, a lawsuit sometime soon. And I know um, Bill's been advocating for a, for some kind of blue ribbon commission or some sort of yeah, investigation yeah. into it. Um, I I think that's a great idea too. Personally, wouldn't, wouldn't Doss have to do that? Basically, I mean, as a political matter, wouldn't he? Have to? I mean, he you would think he would want to get out ahead of it anyway. I mean, as a matter of course, after an event like this, all the public safety agencies and the administrators come together and they do sort of an incident evaluation of what could have done better. But those are technical, pretty much technical reports. I think a grand jury report in this particular case would be useful. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, you know, it's still within the county. It's not like a congressional deal. Um, I think the lawsuit idea, I mean, I, I, it's surprising that one hasn't been filed already. There have been several lawsuits. There have been a lot of lawsuits, but none against the county, the county for screwing up the evacuations of maps. And I was talking to an attorney in town who likes to sue lots of people, and he said, I wouldn't take the case because this threshold. He said, it's like climbing Mount Everest. You can get there, but you'll probably die along the way. It is uh, the burden of, of proof against the county um, is so high. Because it's an act of God? It's not an act of God. You'd have to show that the county had a sort of a plan in place, that it was a ministerial sort of plug in, fill in, you know, this is how you do it. And this is sort of an act of God plus 200 years. I mean, they screwed up in a lot of ways, but is that enough? Um, it's actually the term sovereign immunity is used. So hmm. the county has some protection. And to, to get past that, you'd really have to have not a smoking gun, but probably you know, an arsenal. Have you met homeowners in your reporting who were no. likely to? Uh, there have to been some comments at meetings, but very few. I mean, the, the county gets applauded when people stand up, like Tom Fearham, who's the head of flood control, and uh, Rob Lewin, who's you know running the uh, Office of Emergency Management, and I think that um, the wild card here was the the intensity of the rainfall. It was, yeah. it was very rare event. Now, Dale, if you had run for uh, second district supervisor, <laughs> as, as, we, so as we as we urged <laughs> here on Newsmakers, <laughs> you would be faced with the uh, huge amount of money in lost property tax revenue. What's I mean, how's that? How are we going to deal with that? Or just take it in the shorts? Well, or? there's there there isn't anything that the county can do about the fact that it's losing that revenue. That's that's a fact that it's just going to have to deal with. So. And homeowners are what going to lose the entire value of their property? Who who had their houses wiped out? I mean, well, there is something called a hazard mitigation fund that FEMA, the um, HMF. Yeah, um, <laughs> but for the LIDA, that's pretty far down the road here. But um, it would compensate theoretically for part of the um, property, but the county would have to pick up the rest. I mean, it's not something that could be done. Broadly. All right. Are you hearing? Um, I, I was interviewing somebody the other day. Last. He said, uh, Monsey has lost a thousand people. Have you heard? In anything? population. In population. In population. I, you know, I've heard people are, are uh, not coming back. One, one interesting um, factoid is that out of the 350 badly damaged or completely destroyed homes, only half of those owners. Have contacted their case managers at planning at the planning department, you know, for what does that mean? Meaning, how do I rebuild? Or <clears throat> yeah, yeah, but I mean, why haven't they? You know, <clears throat> they've mentioned that um, the Bucket Brigade, for example, is having trouble contacting homeowners because uh, properties are in trust funds. Wow! Um, and another reason may be that it's um, uh, a second or third home. Uh, 
All right, well, once again, we want to thank Melinda for her doing the uh, Lord's work and um, doing all this reporting and offering it to every, almost every news organization in town for free. Thank you. I mean, it's a great community. Thank you, for, I'm serious. Uh, for yeah. running it, Terry. Yeah. Tyler, you spent a couple of months looking into the fishy affairs of the Bella Squardo Foundation. What is that, and what did you find? Um, it's more what, what I didn't find, I think. <laughs> um, so the Bella Squardo Foundation came together a few years ago to manage the, the Clark estate um, after the late Huguette Hugh, Hugh Clark uh, left it to, to this 501c3 uh, to then turn her mansion up on the hill into a place to... Um, as it says exactly in her will, uh, foster and promote the arts. It's, it's sort of intentionally vague um, so that the foundation could decide how they, how they wanted to interpret it and how they wanted to foster and promote the arts. Um, it's been around for three and a half years, this foundation, uh, and they have done very little to, to nothing to, to realize Hugh Get Clark's it's will. The board is a, was appointed by former mayor, Helene <clears throat> Schneider. That's true. She appointed it um, at, the, at the request um, and approval of the New York Attorney General's office. Um, and so this board and the, and the executive director that they chose, uh, Jeremy Lindemann, who is Helene Schneider's political consultant, um, they've been, they, according to, to Jeremy and um, He's really the only person I've actually been able to speak with who's involved with the Yeah, foundation. nobody else will talk. Right. Dick Wolf, the uh, law and order guy. Right, the chairman. He, he didn't respond to, to my many requests for comment. Um, they, they have said, you know, while they were waiting for these IRS, um, uh, potential IRS penalties, it's a, I mean, were, it's a legal tangle. Yeah, it, it was a, it was a mess with the IRS and the Attorney General's office and here and so there was there's was, the Corcoran Gallery. Yeah, exactly, and the exactly. So and the, so they said their hands were tied until until that has all been worked out. That's now been worked out and now the property has officially transferred to the foundation. It's theirs to do with as they wish. Um, but nobody can find them. But yeah, but <laughs> But there's been there's been enough um, sort of frustration and and questions over the last few and a half years that that multiple board members have quit. Um, they haven't held a single meeting, which is in, in violation of their bylaws. Uh, the longtime caretaker who lived there for decades and was Huguette Clark's right hand man, taking care of this immense property with a ton of deferred maintenance and issues, uh, he was he was fired effectively by um, Jeremy Lindemann. Yep. Is like, Lindemann squatting in the place? <laughs> I, I've heard that he's that he's entertained people there and that he's he's used uh, the former caretaker's house. Um, I can't say for sure that he's he's and he, there. And he, and, he, and he won't talk. Were you on council when this thing uh, first came? When I Helene? was at the beginning of it. I mean, what isn't this like a huge white elephant? What what's the thought about what's going to well, happen? Well, that was always one of the questions. I mean, it, it, as as Tyler said, there's so much maintenance needed to the building and the grounds that there was always a question from the beginning, is there any way to actually make this work financially? And then the appointment of, of Jeremy Lindemann as executive director, and nothing against Jeremy, but this is someone with no experience running this kind of operation. Um, it, whatever yeah, it yeah, is, whatever right. it is. And how much does he get paid? He gets paid, he's been paid 190000 for two years of work, working 10 hours a week, according to the um, IRS filings. Yeah. Um, I don't, you know. So, some, I've heard from the, the accountant that that was, a, that was a... I've heard that they said that for one of the filings, right. but it says it on both filings. It says it for both years. Um, even if he has been doing work, great. I would love to know what that is. We asked him directly multiple times, what have you been doing over these last three and a half years to earn that kind of salary? What steps have you taken? Who have you talked to? What art institutions are you coordinating with? Um, have you done any feasibility studies? Have you done any anything. anything? And he won't answer any of those questions. And he's the only one who... And he's the only one who's, who's, slightly who's authorized answer. to answer questions, which is, I mean... We've heard from multiple experts, and I sort of knew this from the start. It kind of flies in the face of what a 501c3 public charity is supposed to do and meant to do, and because there's so far zero transparency from this from this organization. Nick, isn't this? You agree with me that the? <laughs> All right, now. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I don't think so. But no, go this ahead. Is a, isn't this a case study of the flawed politics of former Helene Schneider, uh, former Mayor Helene Schneider, in that she did not build I, a consensus. I hate to say, Jerry, I, I, I kind of agree with you here. I mean, I think that um, 
the story here was uh, Helene, this was a case where Helene was at the top of her game. She was running for mayor, for re-election as mayor. She was running against a vain throbbing guy who had no chance. Had no, of, chance. had no chance. And she had 90,000 bucks in her bank account. The attorney general of, of New York says, here you get to pick who's on the board. It's like, here's five aces, go play poker. And there were a lot of other people in the community who had an interest in Bella Squardo. Former mayor Former Sheila mayor Lodge Sheila Lodge being one of them. And it was one of those situations where if you sort of, you know, put your arms out and say, everybody come in here, we're going to have a party, you can all have your picture taken, we're all going to get rich on this, we're all going to make something interesting happen. But that wasn't how it was played. It was played, this is, you know, this was Helene's party. And, and so Helene put, installed Jeremy, who is her close political confidant. Clo and close friend. And close friend. And, you know, I could see Jeremy being there in sort of a caretaker role as the IRS issues are worked out. But Helene and Jeremy sort of wore out their welcome in a big way in, a, in the meantime. And so it's going to be very hard to resurrect the white elephant if the white elephant ever had any legs to begin with. And, and, and was the board uh, composed in large part of Helene contributors and or Jeremy clients? Um, I, I can't say that for sure. I know that she chose them specifically because they didn't want to sell the property, that they wanted to do everything they could to convert it into an art museum. Um, that, that was sort of their goal from the get-go. But again, it's been three and a half years, this, this place that has more than $12 million in, in deferred maintenance and plumbing issues. And I mean, it's a, it's a 1930s mansion uh, that, that's slowly falling apart. With some very unimpressive art. Yeah. But a great location. But a beautiful place. What should um, the city do with it? Or what should the foundation do with it, I God guess? God knows. But they need a good foundation. They need to get people, well, they need to get someone with experience in art and art museums, if technically that's what it's supposed to be. Someone with experience in that and reinvigorate a board. Yeah. All right. Good work. Thanks. Dick City Hall for years has been after the shady operations of Dario Pini, landlord to the dispossessed. And you've been covering his trial. Where do things stand? Um, a really huge question mark uh, looms over Dario Pini. Dario Pini, for those who don't know, probably is the single biggest landlord in all of Santa Barbara County. He has about 140 multi family rental units throughout Santa Barbara County. He's got probably 195 or so within the city of Santa Barbara. He tends to rent overwhelmingly to uh, poor working Latino families. Uh, many are Spanish speaking, many are not you know, here with the, the legal documentation. Thousands and thousands. Thousands and thousands of tenants and he's sort of like the court of last resort. Um, he doesn't ask questions, he doesn't care how many people you put in. If you have four kids, if you have eight kids, if you have dogs, if you have cats, no questions asked, move on in. Uh, he does not, he's famous for not managing the places. And as a result, over the years, I mean, back in the 90s, he was um, found guilty of slumlordism of a very egregious uh, nature. Uh, Judge Ochoa at that time said, hey, I'm going to sentence you to either jail or you can live in your own apartments. And Dario Pini very tellingly said, thanks, Judge, I'll take jail. And, uh, really? Yeah. So... And, 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 but, you know, it's this sort of game of cat and mouse. And, and city attorney Ariel Colon, Ariel Colon um, has been after him. Has been after him. So what Ariel did that was very novel, and he really upped the ante and he got uh, Dario's attention, because he didn't just go after Dario. He went after Dario and he went after Dario's bankers. And the bankers said, oh my God, Mr. Kalan, why didn't you call us sooner? We had no idea there was gambling at risk. <laughs> We're shocked. You were shocked. Shocked. And they all, you know, fell over themselves like, oh, we want to work this out. We want to work it. And, and Ariel is very, you know, mm -mm, too late. You had your chance. So he is trying to, there's two actions. One is in Santa Barbara, one is Santa Maria. They're almost identical. And where the city is going after, in Santa Barbara, 11 rental properties. In Santa Maria, I think it's three. Hundreds, uh, hundreds of units, thousands of tenants are being affected. And the million dollar question here is, how does government 
fix up slum conditions without dispossessing and hurting the people they're trying to help. And, the, and so that really is how do you require and fund the relocation of these tenants while the repairs are made to bring the place back up to a habitability level. And is it, it's in court? It, it, the court arguments have uh, concluded. We're waiting for Judge Colleen Stern to issue a ruling. We expect one any time between now and And, and the ruling will say yes or no to what? The, the ruling will say yes to or no to how many properties need to be put in the receivership, which means, Dario, we're taking control of your property. You no longer have control of it. One of those properties, And that would be what, an independent? Uh, it would be an independent uh, contractor, and he would be able to shortstop the rent streams coming in. He'd be able to say, you know what, I'm going to take this property and take out a loan on it to make repairs. One of the properties, and this is a big screw you, um, is Dario's own personal house where he lives. So, like when, when this whole thing broke initially. Is that the one with the picture of the rat? That is the one with the picture of the rat. Yeah. So, you know, and Dario in court and his attorney said, this is clearly a spite move. And I, it's hard. I mean, what you hear is that at one point, the neighbors were complaining there were like 150 toilets parked, you know, stored out in his yard. This is up on Mission Ridge Road. Does so he have renters in his personal house? He, had, he, he ran it kind of as an Airbnb. So I remember, I mean, one time going up there in the middle of the night. Did you stay there? I didn't know, but I was up there for some reason that I don't need to go into now. But you go into his house and there's this big table. Was it Chili Riano night? It was yeah, Chili Riano night. And there was just Wednesday. all these envelopes with cash all over. It was just where all the tenants had come, just piled high. Dale, so, you're a small government, low regulation kind of guy. Is this the proper... Um, um, Effort use of government, by government power. Use of government power? I really have no idea, Jerry. I mean, to be honest, this is the kind of thing where on city council, you really have to be careful and you have to listen to everybody and hear their side of it because some of these things get very, very emotional. Yeah. All right. So you'll come back and tell us I'll what, come the, back what, and the, tell you what more. the verdict is. Well, I think the verdict is pretty clear that they are going to uh, impose receivership on about seven of them. All right. And then in 2013, he paid a big chunk of money for wage theft in all of his hotels, of which he owns several hotels, motels. Uh, and great, a great American. All right, Dale, among your public credentials, you've been Santa Barbara's representative on three regional water boards. With the winter rains basically over, are we in better or worse shape in terms of drought than in recent years? We're still in drought. We're still, <clears throat> according to the, the way NOAA looks at these things, we are in severe drought. Right now, this is continuing. Unlike much of the rest of the state. Well, much of the rest of the state got good rain last in the last season, but uh, we did not. And so far, I mean, assuming we don't get any more rain in this season, we'll be at about 30% of normal. 30%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what's the level of Kachuma now? Kachuma is at 40% as of yesterday, 40.2%. So is the city going to take further action to impose more conservation standards, raise oil? I don't think so. I mean, this is one of those, those great difficulties around water. If you get people to conserve too much, then they're not paying enough money in to keep revenues to, to run the operations. So I think the, my understanding is that the city is going to keep the current conservation level in place. And people have been conserving water. Uh, there's, there hasn't been a problem with that. Um, we have other sources of water. The desal plant is fully operational now. That's, that's good news from the city's point of view. That's almost a third of the total supply can come from desal. That's a, there's a blue, blue sky question. But so much of the water, of course, just runs off to the ocean. In the rest of the state, there's a lot of move to to build reservoirs and, and basins mm -hmm. and so on to cap. Is there mm -hmm. anything from an infrastructure perspective that we could be doing that we're not doing? I, I don't know. I assume because the city hasn't done anything about it and we've got a lot of smart people there in water resources, I, w I would think that the issue would be our storm drains all go into the sewer, right? And so since the, obviously there are people out there, there are scientists out there working on the, on the problem of reusing sewage water and, and treating that back to a drinkable level, uh, but we're a long way off from being able to do that. 
But Galita and Carp are doing a little uh, interesting pilot. Who, are, who is Carp and who? Galita uh, and uh, Carp and Daria are both doing pilot projects on that one. Orange County. Converting sewage water to. They, the, the, the term they don't like is toilets are tapped. The term they do like is. Um, <laughs> Good potable <alliteration>, though. <laughs> potable <laughs> reuse. Recycled. Potable water. reuse. Potable reuse. That's the term they like to use. And really kind of. PRU. Work, yeah. <laughs> One of the things here that is sort of interesting about the desal plant is it does give kind of a camel's nose under the tent possibility for something like that. It creates an infrastructure uh, by which you might be able to, you know, uh, attach some potable reuse to it. In Galena and Carp, they have big water basins, so they could put the, treat the you know, the treated sewage water, but uh, recycled Toilet water. We'll tap. call it recycled yes. water in there for six months or so filtering through, you know, and then take it out of there. That's what Orange County does. Santa Barbara doesn't have the big basins. Do. I mean, Israel has been doing that forever. Yeah, it, in, for Santa Barbara without big basins, That's a problem. they're going to have to do it directly um, Direct into the, the drinking water supply with so, no, no time in underground. So is it an aesthetic question or a plumbing question? Well, it's not even allowable in California yet. They have to change legislation to allow it, but it's coming. Because no if you standards. figure, it's another, it's like another half, it's like you can reuse 80% yeah. or more, 90%. So I why mean, wouldn't you do that? I mean, how many millions of gallons every day are flushed out of the ocean? I mean, yeah. some ridiculously huge number. And the idea that you can't convert some of that into mm -hmm. drinking water, I mean, that is a much more feasible technology and infrastructure than a new dam. And it's in 15, really the 15 seconds, how is this affecting the great white carp or the steelhead, the steelhead. or whatever <laughs> your favorite? Uh, <laughs> you know what? It'll make life easier for the steelhead. It's good for the steelhead. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all we need to know. That's all really. you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks to tonight's panel. Melinda Burns, Tyler Hayden, Nick Welsh, and Dale Francisco. And a quick bittersweet programming note, indie reporter Kelsey Bruger, who's been a mainstay of the Newsmakers panel since we started the program, leaves Santa Barbara and heads off this week to Washington for our, an exciting new journalism adventure. We want to thank Kelsey for all her insights and analysis over the years, not to mention putting up with Josh Molina. And all best wishes from the whole Newsmakers crew. And remember, Kelsey, you can come back anytime at full salary. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, to check out my regular blog posts on politics and media in Santa Barbara and beyond, and our YouTube channel, where you'll find an archive of past shows and special interviews. Thanks again to our director, J.P. Montalvo, and to our crew, Ken, Elliot, Suzanne, and Ashe. And, as always, our top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy, senior executive producer, Hap Freund. Thanks again. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers. Mm -hmm.